Hey guys, welcome to that pedal show. Dan here. Mick here. Lee here. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> guys, it's uh, Lee Malia from Bring Me The Horizon. Uh, mate, thank you so much for having us down here today. Um, up here, I should say. Uh, this is something I've wanted to happen for years now, and we've finally been able to get it all together. Yeah. So yeah. We're brilliant. in the north of England, it's freezing. Um, but we've been very kindly invited to this facility where all the gear is, uh, and Lee's gonna show us through some stuff, and we're gonna chat about stuff. Happy yes. days. Very yeah. cool. Um, yeah, so I, uh, I have tons of questions uh, after sort of immersing myself in your back catalogue. Um, but I guess the, I, the first thing to, to start, I guess, is I mean, how did this all start for you? Uh, playing guitar. Yeah. In the first way. Um, I, me, my dad was always, he's like, he's always been into classic rock. And, right. And then through to like David Bowie and Beatles and, you know, just like anything, any good music pretty much. And uh, he always had guitar, like a guitar in the house and uh, he wanted me to play so he'd put one in my room. Like, I can't remember what it was. I think it was like a Strat copy or something, right. like a cheap one. And uh, I never played it. We never bothered about it. And then I asked him to like move it out of my room because I thought it was going to get broke when my mates were around and stuff. And then he moved it. And then three months later, it came to, to like Christmas and I'd, I'd asked for like a BMX <laughs> for Christmas. <laughs> and then like two days before Christmas, I was like, oh, I really want a guitar. And they were just like, you've never, never mentioned a guitar in, ever. And it just give his guitar away to my cousin or something and all this stuff. Um, so then from like Christmas money, I'd got 80 pounds. So I went to Fox's Music. I don't know whether they used to have that down south, but Fox's Music in Meadowall and I bought a 80 pound Strat copy called a Falcon, I right. think it was. <laughs> and then that started from there. I was just obsessed from that day. Wow. No, no idea why really. I just got to an age where music like clicked. How, 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 how old are you here? <clears throat> um, I think I was about 13 or 14. Right. I've been one of them kids who just, you know, like had hobbies for like two weeks. Sure. Just went through everything. Like I would, I'd done that and then got into guitar and then became like obsessed with guitar. Just sat in my room for hours, mm. try, trying to play stuff and used to buy, you know, like the tab books. Yeah. And uh, used to download off tab crawler and like print out, I had like, stacks of like tabs printed out of just like my favorite they're probably all wrong but like yeah just used to sit there and learn them what were you learning uh, anything i think like the first thing my dad showed me was uh smoke on the water okay like but on like one string you know, like, sure sure like that and so I'd, he always taught well he, he taught me a couple of little things because he can play the guitar a little bit he'd mm -hmm. always just been like you know he'd wanted to play guitar but he'd never like got anywhere if you okay. know what i mean but so he knew like really simple things. So he, he, he taught me that and I think he taught me Apache, do you know, by uh, yeah, the yeah. shadows. And then Mission Impossible, stuff like, do you know, just like, but when you're a kid, it's stuff that you can play and enjoy. Sure. So yeah, it like yeah. worked. So like, it's just from there. And then I'd go up in my room, call him up like two hours later and, and be like, oh, I've learned this. And he was just like, oh, this is crazy. Cause he, he always wanted to learn stuff, but he, I suppose he started learning too late. Right. And you know, you get to an age where stuff doesn't go in as easy. Yeah, which yeah. Which I feel like I'm at now. Like when I try and learn, <laughs> I try and learn, you know, like I want to learn a song now, I'll sit down and by the time I'm like reading it or trying to learn it, I forgot what the part was before and stuff. And I'm just like, oh, I wish I were back at that age where everything just went just in clicked. and stayed in. Yeah. But yeah, so just just playing weird little little things, sure. like little sections of songs. Thing is, you had time, didn't you? When you were a teenager, you yeah. were a young teenager, you had time. Because yeah. you yeah. didn't have to do anything else. And now, now you're, watching you're, you're today. probably learning something and thinking, oh, I've got to go and yeah. go to Sainsbury's. <laughs> and also, I didn't have a mobile phone. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah right. And internet was like, pay by the minute. So I was allowed on for like 20 minutes and then it was like... So less distractions. Yeah. yeah, like, otherwise you've gone PlayStation maybe yeah. or something, but... Yeah. I don't know, there's so many, you had so many spare hours, like you say, and just, if you had an interest, you could just do it. Mm. So I used to spend hours playing guitar. So I think it's fair to say that from that point to sort of where you've arrived now, that your journey has been, you know, amazing. Mm. Um, so the earlier Bring Me the Horizon stuff was, you know, very heavy. And there's still those elements in there. Uh, but how... Like, where did you get to a point where the, the 
the, the heavy tones really connected to you? What was the sort of the the instigation for that? Um, I've I've said it in loads of interviews. Like uh, I got into Metallica right. through you no know, S and M. Like uh, my dad played that in the car. We were going somewhere and just really liked it. Started listening to Metallica and then. The shop I bought my guitar from, I used to go in all the time whenever my family went to Meadowall, I'd be like, oh, can I go in Foxes and just try guitars, you know, like like you do as a kid. And there were a, a guy who worked there and he, he just went to me, oh, you need to buy Ride the Lightning. Um, if you like Metallica, I went, I think that same day and like convinced my parents to buy me Ride the Lightning CD. Mm. And then that's like a, a step heavier than S&M, do you know what I mean? Because it's right. their old thrashier stuff. And then from there it just, leads into heavier music, I guess. Like I got into like Cannibal Corpse and and like ridiculously heavy stuff and then got into Slipknot. Do you right. know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah. when you were when yeah. you were a young kid and just kept I suppose you always want that next like hit of like finding someone, especially back then because the like I said the internet weren't as uh, I mean it took you a day to download one song. Sure. So it's yeah, like yeah, sure. you'd get like one by a band and then you'd be obsessed with that one song and just like keep playing it. So I just kept doing that, and then <clears throat> I don't know. Just and then I met like some of the Matt from uh, the drummer in our band. Met him at college when I was sixteen, and and he was into like hardcore music, right. which was I don't know. It's, I suppose that's like a bit different to what I was into. I was into the more metal side mm -hmm. of music, and we started going to like shows in Sheffield with him and Ollie, and just went from there. That's how I discovered like that that side of the music where sure. like you go to a show and people were jumping off yeah. in like a pub like smaller than this and people are like jumping jumping off like chairs at back at room on your head and stuff which <laughs> so is pretty cool <laughs> i like it like and it just made like that whole uh the whole adrenaline rush right it was like made me get into that side of the music that heavy side of music it's so one really interesting thing being here and, and just hearing you get the sounds together so <clears throat> we've got a couple of 100 watt marshals, yeah. cranked, and hearing the sound of these loud amps again, it's like, man, yeah, it yeah, just yeah. gets the blood going. It's great. You know? For, uh, in case you're confused at this point, so obviously uh, Lee's rack is there and the heads are there. The cabs are about, um, I don't know, seven or eight meters that way because these amps are cranked. It's really crazy loud and it's a wonderful thing to, uh, to hear. Yeah. Uh, there, we'll put a picture up on screen now as to how they're mic'd and all of that, but we'll get into that as we go along. But um, yeah, that's what's happening. There's two 4x12 cabs over there with six microphones on it. It's like happy days. Happy days. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to ask you, because the heavy stuff isn't something that I ever, I mean, I've always really enjoyed the sound of it, but I was never good at it. Yeah. Right? And, you know, whether it's a was a technique or something, I'm sure there's a load of, load of uh, people watching and, and who know your music. And they're wondering, you know, okay, as far as being able to achieve those sorts of things, what's the, some of the first things you need to be able to do? Uh, for the, especially for like the older, the first couple of CDs, it was like there's so much palm muting, right? Which I, uh, I guess I learned from Metallica because they they used a lot of like some of the, a lot of their rhythm stuff was like chuggy and palm muted, so I like I kind of knew what I was doing with that, you know, anyway, right. without even like thinking about like, oh, we need to, I need to learn this. Um, so like, we used to do like breakdowns, what they're called breakdowns, you know, where you do yeah. double kick at the same time as guitars and it sounds like a machine. <laughs> it's okay. like basically that and like, so originally, oh, when we first started, we literally said, oh, we want to write music that we can play in a pub and people will mosh to. Okay. So it was every section, if you listen to it, it's a section that you can mosh to into a section that you can mosh to into. It's, there's no like, it's not a song, do you know what I mean? Right. It's like, we just wrote like a collection of heavy things and said, oh, if we play this in that pub that we went to last week, everyone will go crazy right. and like kick each other and stuff. And that's all we did it for. And then it, it grows from there when sure. you realize like, oh, I don't know, it's, it's probably better if you have like something else in the song that isn't just a breakdown. So yeah, I think like palm muting and... Can we hear a little bit of that with the sound you got now? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things. I used to use, well, not back then, but like, I, you know, like 5150 yeah, or whatever yeah, with yeah, loads yeah. of gain. Yeah. And if you palm mute that, it will ring for as long as you want, pretty much. But nowadays, like with this, 
it's not the same sound. So, sure. And we don't really play that stuff anymore. So if I palm mute on this, it's not the same effect at okay. all. But yeah. like, I can, like, you can do like the... But it's gone, do you know what I mean? So it's the sustain at the end of that. Yeah, so if you've got, if you've got a, a lot of gain and EMGs, okay. <laughs> can you chug like that? <clears throat> a lot of old breakdowns are like the prolonged chugs and, and they'll ring and drum will be on China. Do you know what I mean? Right. It's like, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> it's like that, but with this tone, it's not the same effect at all. Sure. But that's like a development that I went through of realizing that like to be heavy, you don't have to do that sound. Right. And I, now to me, heavier is when you like ring stuff, it, it sounds more intense to me than a subdued like chug. It's okay. like, so like learning to like, stuff can be heavy without just doing the same chug patterns constantly sure. and stuff like that. And then that, that all develops from the tone as well. Like mm. from using these amps, I played in a different way to when I used a 5150 or stuff can like that. Can we talk about that a bit? I find, so I find this really interesting. So you talk about the 5150s, which have got tremendous amount of gain, <coughs> that real yeah. super heavy sound, mid scoopy. <laughs> Here, am I right in saying we're just hearing the guitar into the amp, the 800? Uh, with an overdrive. And what's the overdrive we're hearing there? So it's a, it's a clone Centaur. Yeah. But it's a, it's a, a guy from Scotland makes yeah. a rip-off version or like his own version, DIY version, and it sound like I took it to the studio recently, and they had an original clone Centaur there, and I've used one on the last three CDs because there's, they're always in studio. No, when you go to a yeah, nice studio, yeah. they always have one, and I've tried to buy two. And both times when I've bought them, I've paid and then they've sent the money back and not sent them. So I don't know what's going on on, oh, wow. on eBay. But um, this is so close. Mm. Like in the studio, we lit, me and the engineer literally A and B them. And it's so close that we're just like, I'm, I was just like live, no one's going to hear what we're hearing through yeah. a mic in a studio. Well, like live, no one's going to hear that. So touring with that, which costs 125 quid or something, wow. like, yeah. opposed to buying a two grand. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, what's, think, what's it doing for you then? So, because you've had the gain almost on zero on this. Yeah, it's just it's just, just a level boost. Yeah, right. yeah so like, so it's just <laughs> without it, it's just. And then as soon as you put that in, it's. Just... So it's like that makes up a lot, but it doesn't change the tone. No, no. It just like adds all the. Intense. Sound. Is there anything the clone can't do? Uh, <laughs> I tell you what's interesting about that is the heaviness. Because if you, oops, sorry, on a bit of a wobbly drum set, um, the heaviness is coming from the volume and mm. speakers and your attack to the guitar yeah. is not coming from what you think it might, should come exactly. from, which yeah. is a ton of gain. Because I guess I that's the that first instinct, right? Because like, yeah, yeah, yeah. guys are going to be going, well, I need more distortion. Yeah, you know? exactly. and I find as well, presence is a huge thing. On um, like, not a lot of amps have the same. I don't know what the presence does, but it does a lot yeah. more than people think, I think, a lot of the time. And the more like, if you get the presence right on, on the amp, it, it it tricks you into thinking there's more gain. Sure. Like, yeah. But yeah. it's not more gain, yeah. it's just more intense and mm. more like direct that it's like. It, depending on what the presence circuit is, there actually is more gain. Yeah. Oh, right, it, yeah. it controls something <laughs> called negative feedback in the power amp section. Right. Yeah. And it, it basically allows the power amp to go like completely right, open, open up. whereas yeah. you, you turn the presence down, depends on what the circuit is. Yeah. But and then, it, so there actually is more gain. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, bottom and top, right, yeah. right, right across the spectrum. So yeah. the amp is more open. That's yeah. what, that is exactly what you're hearing. Because I've, I've been through other amps that are like, kind of like a, a Marshall 800 kind of mm. based amps and they haven't had the presence. And that is where we, me and Joey always going about like, this, we always say the bite of the yeah. amp. Like, yeah. you know, when, when I like, when I do like the, it's so, it's so <laughs> direct and like, responsive to what I'm doing. Because you can hear, when you do that, yeah. and it's really fast, but it's you can hear every pick attack. Yeah. It's so articulate. That, and that's all that, like it's it's quite clear, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Like intense sounding, like. Yeah. And the amount of, we, we've toured, when you tour festivals, there's always other bands there and mm. stuff. Mm. And the amount of people that have asked me, enjoy what's, it, what's the mod on the amp and stuff, like, well, what have you done to these 800s to make them sound like that? And we're just like, oh, it's nothing to do with that. It's like, that that makes up a, sure. a huge like amount yeah. of like yeah. push to the front end, but it's I think a lot of it comes down to like the plane and it works. Like you could look at the EQ on the amp, mm. and it, for someone playing in standard with a Strat, it'd probably sound terrible. 
or right. like you know way too like way too trebly or sure. way too bassy and stuff but when you put that with that and then these strings and tune it to how this it makes perfect sense if you know what i mean and it's all it's all like down to like 10 factors please sure <laughs> everything matters. before we get to the strings that it, that is so interesting because we've so many of our favorite players aren't afraid to treble yeah you know what i mean there are a lot of guitar players who are like really afraid yeah, of, that, yeah. of getting that treble in there but to hear the heavy thing and i'm, I'm thinking you know okay heavy guitars the first thing i'm thinking is so much bottom end and stuff but yeah. but hearing the uh the detail yeah. in your sound mm. and it's all coming from well you just lose it wouldn't you that so how big is the bottom string on that guitar that's an 80. okay <laughs> so you and it's tuned two at the moment that's in c c okay yeah. so you hit an you hit an 80 at C and you had a load of gain and a load of bottom that's just gone. Yeah. It? yeah, yeah, right. It's like sludge. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Basically. But that, that much treble probably wouldn't work if it had more gain. Sure. You know, like yeah, if yeah. I, it becomes if, fizzy. If there was all more gain, yeah, yeah. it'd just get like crazy. But, and like, there's been pictures up of my stuff before online. People have been like, why? You'd never run bass that high and, and you'd never run EQs like that and stuff. But it, it does sound right. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so it's like it. maybe in your bedroom it sounds terrible or yeah. in a in a small venue it might just be too much and stuff like that. But for what we do it does work, sort of thing. So there's always like factors to it. If I if we had that cab behind us now, it'd just be like chaos, do you know what I mean? Like because sure. it'd be way too loud and stuff like that. So there's there's so many factors. And we're lucky enough now that we're in venues where the cabs can be just in a different room. Right. Uh or under the stage. Because we went through like a middle ground where the venues weren't quite big enough to do that. Mm. Uh, and I still had amps on the stage and sound guys just hated me because they were like, just turn it down. But then everything changes. If of course. It, if, and if you turn it up from there as well, like <clears throat> you always think with valves, if you run it full volume, it's going to sound better. Mm. You always kind of hear that rumor. <laughs> mm. But anything past where that's at now, it gets muddy. Sure. So we found like this sweet spot and run it at that but if I turn it down from there it loses a lot of stuff and I turn That's it up amazing. from there it loses a lot so it's like I mean it's just years of playing with an 800 that you find like a different thing do you know what I mean that works it's amazing just find that place that's right for you yeah mm. because you're, you're as soon as you change that you're changing the the dynamic between the amplifier and the speaker and the way the speaker's reacting yeah. and, the, and all that stuff but that's that's another thing like the way the speaker's breaking up so mm. like having an attenuator after the amp to the speaker Technically, people would think, oh, it's going to sound the exact same, but it's not because the speaker's not reacting. Not working the same way. At all yeah. the same way. So when you're on in it, it like in ears, the difference in like in that is huge to me. Like right. I can hear if, and this is no lie, like I can hear if the mic is not exactly where it should be by like a, a couple of centimeters. I'll, I'll instantly play and be like, that mic's out of place. And yeah. Joey, I'm going, look. And like, so like, it's just from touring so long, and especially when we moved to in ears, it's mm. so direct in my head that I know my tone to like, I know if there's like slightly too many mids or sure. something, do you know what I mean? Sure. It's like, it's from touring and hearing it constantly yeah. For, yeah. for years. You get you get used to the amp. How you, you, haven't, you haven't broken down and gone, do you know what, it would just be so much easier to trash all this and let's go Helix or Kemper or something and put um, everything in. I mean, everyone, everyone who's not me and Joey suggests that. So like, <laughs> everyone is like, wouldn't it just be easy to get one of them? And it sounds the same to them. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's so many factors. Like, it doesn't sound the same to me. Like, and and I've I've literally profiled that amp in a studio to that, and then played them side by side, and there is a difference. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know what it is, sure. but there is a difference. That doesn't react how that reacts sure. when you're playing. There's just a load of fact, like a lot of factors. It, it just, to me, that doesn't. I mean, it's great for yeah, people. For as a tool yeah. for what yeah, for yeah. Sp very specific things. And it, if and if you're touring and you're in a van and you're loading your own gear in and stuff like that, I'd probably want one of them. Do you know sure, what I mean? Because sure. like, I just put that that on stage and and that's it. I'm done. I'm ready mm. and run like a MIDI pedal board, but. It doesn't. It doesn't react the same at yeah, all. Yeah. Like there's a difference between playing into a valve amp with that pedal and then sure. playing into that tone captured into there. Yeah. It's not the same reaction and and all that sort of stuff. So I don't think I'd ever do that unless so I was forced to. Yeah, it just keeps you happy. <laughs> so yeah. um, 
we're, 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 you know, we're going to go through the rig in detail yeah. in a bit, but you're using the Kemper to, um, like, there's one of the things about, you know, the last few albums is the range of tones that you use is so diverse. Yeah. Um, so I'm assuming that that is being used for some more specific. Yeah, like studio tone, like. So when you're in the studio, you might just grab a, ran, a random amp that's mm -hmm. in there. There's some Searching pedals that different. you don't know. Yeah, yeah. you want something so specific, you mm. can make it. Um, so that's where the Kemp comes in handy. Rather than me having to buy like 10 new pedals, sure. try and rig them all in or mm -hmm. a new amp and have a third like amp. It just It's really good for specific weird tones. Uh, and, and we almost use it like an effects pedal. Yes. So we, yeah, okay. we have it set up so if I want like a fuzz, but I want to keep my, so like on the CD, there might be my normal tone and then a fuzz tone over the top or whatever. We can do that. We can add that in through right. a separate cab. To sit on top of the Marshall. Yeah. yeah. So you've got like your normal tone still there. That doesn't drop out. Mm -hmm. It adds on and widens up live and like the sound guy can do what he wants with it. Mm -hmm. But like we try and use it that way, which I've not really seen that many people doing. I think that I've seen a lot of people that either switch just to them, but sure. we're kind of using it in, so like these sections in clean where I'll use it as like a with like a phaser on and stuff, do you mm. know what I mean? But then I've got my normal clean tone mm -hmm. as well. So it's like it, it, I'm using it just to add or like fill in gaps that would just be almost impossible to bring live. Sure. Yeah. Good. Actually, would it be a good time to talk about the sort of basic amp setup? So you've got one for heavy tones, yeah. one for cleans, and, and the Kemper for the other stuff. Yeah. Can we just talk through that for a second? Yeah. So. My main 800 is my my main like riff tone, mm -hmm. gain tone, um, which is just the 800, the clone, clone thing, and uh, and a noise gate mm -hmm. because more just for like hum and stuff like that. Sure. We, we don't really get feedback because there's not that much gain and the amps aren't usually that near me. And we don't have monitors on stage now because mm -hmm. we're all on in-ears. So it's more just for electronic hum and stuff like that. And then the... The JTM is just for my clean. And then like, I'll run the soul food into that and it's like a crunchy, pushed clean. Uh, and that's through, well, this is where Joey did something cool. So I told him, I, we used to just have them two amps mm -hmm. and that was it. And then I was like, oh, I want to bring in the Kemper as well for like extra stuff. So he's split a cab into two sections mm -hmm. and then the Kemper comes through two speakers on one side and the clean through the other two. Right. Um, yeah, so it's like two 4B12s, but one split. Sure. So it's, it's like, it works pretty cool, but then we run the Kemper also through the power amp of the spare 800. Ah, oh, so, right. okay, that's so it's, really interesting. So it's actually, hitting a valve power section uh, yeah. going to the... Okay. So it yeah. still comes out of a cab through a yeah. mic yeah. through the power section of the 800 rather than like a digital power sure. section. So... It still it brings a bit of like valve life to it. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, so yeah. can we hear a clean? Yeah. Let's hear yeah. Some of that. So there's like this will be all free. Turn that on the Kemper will just really almost too much effect, if you know what I mean. And when you have the JTM, it's just like, oh. Wonderful Life, a song we've got. The verse is, it pretty much sounds like a bass, because um, it's like the neck pickup of this with the 80. Um, and I used in the studio, I think I might have put it through a bass amp. Right. And then and then like used like some gain and stuff. Uh so I tried to like replicate that with the Kemper. Um I was tuned. Is that the one Danny Phil sings on? Is that the yeah. track? Yeah. Yeah. On the but it's like a weird Specifically, weird, but I can do that with that. Yeah, <laughs> it comes right. in handy. Yeah. Whereas to 
get that out of an 800 might take about five pedals sure. and, and weird stuff, but yeah. So for you switching between amps for the heavy tones and the clean tones, it's important to keep those two things separate? Yeah. Why I, is that? Um, well, I've always liked a really clean, clean. Like, yeah. yeah, right. Um, so I've always used a separate head for my clean stuff when I can. Or in the studio, I used like a, you know, the Marshall Blues Breaker co mm -hmm. like combo mm -hmm. and stuff. And I don't, I've always liked the cleans to be almost like ambient and um, and really like a lot of reverb and mm. delay and spacey sounding. Um, and you can get like a nice clean out like my 800, but it's not the same. It's yeah. like... And the EQ, like I always think that the EQ on a, a clean amp is going to be different to the EQ on a gain amp. So yeah, if yeah, I want yeah. like a, a really nice clean, I'm probably going to have, I'm not going to like lean down and EQ my amp, you know, every time I go to clean and stuff. Yeah. So I suppose I could put an EQ pedal in the loop to do that. But I just like the separate. And and also different mics on the on the clean cab mm -hmm. and stuff like that coming. Like, and different speakers. And, yeah. yeah. And so it's, yeah, You I were mean, playing some amazing stuff earlier, which was re super ambient, like really lush reverbs oh, yeah. and stuff. That's just, um, I'm trying to find my tones. This is all like switched by a MIDI track now mm. live, so I don't ever like oh, to press it. it. So it's the, yeah. in the live show, everything's controlled? Yeah, it's, it's been synced up to like a time code because we have video behind us and then the lights and stuff. So now our keyboard is still, press. well, it's tech press like play on the click track and that will trigger my board to the mm -hmm. next song and all this stuff, yeah. which at first, me and Joy was like, no, we're not doing that. And then like, <laughs> cause you feel like you're losing control sure. of your stuff. Cause I, I always loved having a pedal board in front of me with all my pedals mm -hmm. so I could see them. Then we switched to this, which was weird to lose, like seeing my pedals in front of me and not like having to play them. Sure. Uh, but so it's just like gradual steps. In, like, but that's an evolution yeah. of where you are as a band and you know, as, as yeah. a, you know, and it's like having a clean stage because we have a lot of production. So if you've got all this like super nice production and then there's just me stood in front of a pedal board, yeah, right. tap dancing, it's not going to look as good as if I don't have to worry about that stuff. I can concentrate on performing or, sure. do you know what I mean? Sure. So it, 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 it works. It's just, it's just hard to get used to, but like the... Yeah, so like I use that that clean tone, and then with the cathedral, you do that. That's amazing. It's yeah. massive, isn't it? I need to ask you about your 80. Yeah. Uh, so I, I've never heard of a guitar player having a, I mean, I use I use 52s to 11s. And most people pick up my guitar and go, oh man, how do you play with this? Your E string is an 80, yeah. as, which, I mean, that's a, that's a bass string. Yeah. Um, it actually is a bass yeah. string. How did, was, how, did, how did that happen? Um, we, because we, we started tuning down when we thought it was like heavier. No, when we were younger, we were just like, oh, if you tune down, it's heavier. Right. And I don't even think we knew that you could get heavier strings when we first, because there was internet, but it was not like today where you could you could just Google whatever, or you, you could go on YouTube and, and find out straight yeah. away. Like we just, the only way we learned stuff was from like meeting other bands right. and, and seeing what they were doing and that. So we just tuned down and we're still playing probably like just your regular slinky Ernie mm -hmm. Balls. So it's, it probably sounded terrible and they were flapping and uh, and then we the first time we toured America, I went into a guitar center which was like crazy because we've never had a good guitar shop around here. Mm. And they had the, I think it was a Zach Wild custom set and I think his went up to maybe a 64 or a 70 or something like that he, in his custom set of Ernie Balls. Wow. So we were just like, oh, we'll buy them because um, they must be heavier because the they are heavier. Right, <laughs> so we yeah. thought they'd be like heavy, like non nothing really made sense. In? Uh yeah. Yeah, I right. think so. In his own stuff. Okay. Yeah. I right. mean, yeah. unless he's not, I'm no, using that. But he definitely yeah. did, he definitely did. But uh, yeah, we found them. And then it became like 
because we were tuned so low, and then we started tuning one string to G, and then so like a 64 like, is still not like heavy enough. So then uh, we just kept trying heavier strings, and then I think like our bassist just had like an 80 line about, and my tech was just like, do you want me to put that on and see what, what it's like? So we did, and he, he like he had to drill out the tuner, and the in like in this first act, he had to like drill into there to make the the ball on the end of the string fit in, if you know what I mean. And um, tried it, and I loved it like instantly. It sounds different, mm. but it sounds like a sound I like. Yeah. And, um, and I've always been quite heavy-handed with my right hand, yes. and with lighter strings, it just they go all over, if you know what I mean. Like we recently got a guitar and we strung it too light for a show and instantly I just sound like I can't play, do you know what I mean? So like, I just so what you so, so because you were with the lighter strings, <clears throat> when you would hit it, you were finding it would go out of tune? Yeah. Right. Well, yeah, massively. And I used to snap strings constantly as well. Wow. Like every tour, it'd be every three shows, I'd probably snap a string within like the first two songs. I guess it's because adrenaline you like, Playing hard, which sounds a bit stupid, but like it's it's part of the the way our song sound is like yeah. driven. Like I know it's a single string, so it's not technical or anything, but it has a sound to it, and um, yeah, it just all developed from there. And I think another thing is we started adding strings and and more like electronic stuff to a sound. Uh -huh. So I started developing like playing like on a single string rather than doing chords and stuff. And I don't know, I don't think we thought about it at the time, but it leaves so much space for other stuff if you're just playing a single wow. string like root. Sure. But it also doesn't take away everything from the bass, which it will be doing that. So it, it it slotted in. Like sometimes you hear bands try and like do electronics in the sound, it just doesn't like click. There's no, and, there's not a space there yeah, for it to fit. And to for work. some reason with ours, probably because we did this single string riff, electronics, there was so much space for like mm. higher melody in a gap, if you know what I mean. Can we hear a single string riff? So a lot of it's single string sections. So we we do like riffs and then single string stuff. So it's like that. <laughs> stuff like that. And it's, I don't know, it just has a sound to it. It really, it really does. does. Man, really it's does amazing. Yeah, I, I, for, for anyone watching this, laughing at me and Dan being amazed by this, you know, because it's not our thing, right? We're not, we don't know about these sounds. Yeah. yeah. But it is completely unique and it sounds really different. Yeah. Like there's well, no way, I mean, I, my, my telly can sound heavy, rock, yeah. but it, there's absolutely no way no, no. you make any, a noise anything like that. I'm fascinated by how you keep it in tune. I could never keep it in tune. It, yeah. I think um, Joey just has to stretch the strings a lot. Right. Because. It, I mean, they do they do go out every so often, but in between every song, I I restretch them like even on right. stage. Yeah. So when I'm tuning, I'll, I'll be stood there. I'll do that to the especially to the eighty every time. Yeah. And I always stretch it up rather than trying to bend it because I'm probably not strong enough to bend it <laughs> enough out of tune. But it might drop a little bit if you know what I mean. But like, uh, it stays quite well to be fair. And you've never been tempted to do the extended scale thing. Uh, no, I don't know why though. I mean, yeah, it'd probably yeah. make it easier to do that and then use a lighter gauge maybe or whatever, but... I, 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 you know, I don't know, I think they end up sounding more like basses. The, the yeah. longer you the, the go, baritone. the more it sounds like a baritone. Yeah, yeah I suppose right. it's going to affect, like, where everything is yeah. from yeah, each yeah, other. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. But, Such a no, great sound. It's a, it's a brilliant sound. And and another thing as well, do you know the new... Um, I forgot what they're called. The new bridges that when you can't go, you can't play out of tune. Yes, uh, ever -tune. Ever -tune. Ever tune. A lot of bands use them now, which... <clears throat> I kind of like when you attack the string, you hear like the wham yeah. first where it like goes sharp and then back down. But we've always like kind of used that in our sound as it's part of it. You hear sure. like, it's like a dynamic, do you know what I mean? Yeah. You hear like, it's like the attack of that and then back down. Yeah. And yeah, it gives a human element and I wouldn't like it if every note, I mean, it couldn't do that. Sure. Like I can't imagine playing in that way. Another thing is I figured out only recently that I hold my pick weird. Right. So I've only recently realized that people play like that. Okay. Like, like, is it like that? But I've always held my pick like in like my think, I don't know. Like this? Okay. Yeah. Which like, I think is what gives me the like spank okay. sound. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and any highlights I want to do to the riff. So like if you're doing like a, 
a, a, a pattern to the single string stuff and you want the like bounce sound, I've always up picked them because you get the slap of the string going like bonk wow. away. So like if you down pick them like it sounds different to if you go. You know what I mean? So like try and show you So if you're doing like a It's like it's like part of the sound <laughs> yeah. is the But then that strike. Yeah. So you, you get like a, It's like, I don't know, it sounds a certain way. Yeah. Then if you did like, I don't know, you were like a wow, wow, wow. Yeah. Wow. It's all it's weird. So weird much techniques. aggression in it. Yeah. But it's, but it's not. It sounds like someone going. Yeah. yeah. But it doesn't, it's like, but again, it's like, you know, when we talk about this to old Van Halen and old ACDC, those sounds aren't crazy distorted. No. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Um, me, yeah. And it's, I would think that for this, I, I, I was. I'd assume there was much more gain than there is, but it's actually yeah, yeah, it's yeah. the it's the because you can hear the guitar with this. Mm. You know, it's like for me, um, there's there's music where there's a lot more distortion where you just can't hear the guitar, the dynamic yeah. guitar at all. Yeah. But I can still hear the guitar. I can I can hear the pick. Mm. You know, yes. Yeah, uh, that's another interesting thing is that why I've never really liked compressors. Right, you know, on my guitar yeah. because it kind of levels everything. Sure. Well, I, I mean, I've. I've never probably not messed with them enough because I know people love them. But mm. for me, I like how if I pick harder, it gets louder sure. and yeah, stuff yeah. like that. And sometimes with compressor, it seems to sandwich it too much. Do you know what I mean? You, you've me. got enough with the way that the amplifier is running, and you've got enough dynamic limitation already happening organically yeah. in the amplifier yeah. itself. You don't need to add any more yeah. to do speaker. that. And the speaker when you're yeah. spanking yeah. it yeah. that hard. I yeah, think yeah, a lot yeah. of people who don't who aren't able to run their amps like that are looking for a bit more of that element in their yeah, sound who use yeah. a compressor that way. I get that. Um, yeah. But yeah, man. It's, same with my in-ear mix. Uh, like sound guys have tried like using compression in my ears and I can't I can't like have it because I need to hear when I'm playing quieter. So sure. I want it to yeah, drop yeah. out. If I want it to like fade out a note mm -hmm. on clean, I want it to do that in my ears as sure. well and not be pushed back up to be loud all the time and mm. stuff. So it's like, I don't know. I've never, especially not in an in-ear mix. But mm. I suppose, I suppose a eight hundred gets quite compressed anyway when you crank it. When you it. run it, run yeah, it like this, so yeah. You don't really need that. some of the key effects yeah. that you're using, um, this being that pedal show and everything. Yeah. <laughs> um, and just maybe some examples of how uh, that fits in with some of the sounds as you, because having a listen through the, the back catalogue, I've been astounded 
like the change at the sort of development of the band. Yeah. So it, like really super heavy tones early on, and and as Dan said earlier, still there now. But the amount of ambience yeah. and spacey stuff that's happening now is really enveloping. It's yeah. Um, this, a lot of it is down to the the Strymons. I used to use for years um, a Boss DD7 and, mm -hmm. and RV5 mm -hmm. reverb, which were amazing. They never never ever broke. Mm -hmm. Like they always sound exactly as you left them, if you know what I mean. Sure. And I love the sound of them. Um, it's just with these, you can do MIDI. You can have different banks. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. There's so much stuff and there's so much detail in these uh, without having to lean down and change my pedals and sure. stuff like that. So these, these are so much more practical and they sound really good. Like the Strymon stuff sounds great. Sounds magic. Yeah. Um, so they're, they're, my clean sound pretty much always has both of them on. Okay. Either, either a shorter or longer delay, uh, reverb. And the delay I kind of don't use as, you don't really hear it, it's more just to linger the stuff, if right. you know what I mean, to make to make notes last longer. So when you're... I guess it's so it carries on when I'm moving. Sure, <laughs> so sure. It's like, yeah. not, not to a super extent, but like, it just keeps everything going yeah. enough without hearing my hand moving to the next chord and stuff and that's where I always got uh, that's where I got into like using delay as well just as like a underneath the reverb sound and when we have sp like specific delay sections where it it's a hard delay do you know what I mean sure. here but other than that they're just pretty much always on together and that sometimes switches to a shorter delay a shorter reverb right. if it sounds too messy right um, okay for sections where I'm playing something that's you need to hear more right and like the way I use the reverb, you kind of don't hear any of the attack of the guitar right. on on the like stuff where I'm like trem picking. It's more of just like the reverb effect. So I try and find like a set uh, a setting with that on, <laughs> which is hard nowadays. <laughs> There's so many. So it's like super unclear. I just probably spoke over the. No, it's, <laughs> so fine, it's, fine. it's super unclear, but it's more like a sound rather than a guitar, if you know what I mean. It's a it's, texture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. The, that's yeah. the word I mean. You see that track? It's called Doom. That's yeah. Called, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. It's, it's exactly it's what it's like. yeah. yeah. So on your. On but that your, weren't actually from that song. Oh, okay. <laughs> on funny. your switcher board here, then. So mm. you've got every song by. You've got every uh, patch of. Uh, Bank of patches by song. Yeah, right? and then every like section yeah. that changes, which is weird. <laughs> like, because I used to just have like I don't know, eight sounds that were for the set. Sure. Yeah. And then I tweak maybe a couple of pedals mm. for, for specific stuff. But with this, it just means that every section can have its own little where these all specific, change. Specific yeah, like, yeah. program sound that changes by yeah. MIDI. And you yeah. don't have to worry about it. Yeah, and then certain it. songs like Joey will switch uh, the clone off. And stuff. Do you know if I if it's like a cleaner drive sound right. and stuff like that, or just like little tweaks? Joey does for me, mm -hmm. um, like on the cathedral. He might change the 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 reverb setting. You like use the cathedral, one. then really just, you you use that sort of right at the front. Yeah. Um, so I use it sometimes to take away the pick attack, right. so it sounds more like. Not. I mean, it doesn't sound like an ebo, but when it's in the mix, you kind of get an ebo effect. Sure. So. Uh, I love the drawers thing, Dan. So cool. I think the next iteration of the pedal board might involve drawers. <laughs> so you get... Yeah, so you kind of, it's not an Ebo, but it's, sure. it, when I'm playing live, I can like, I can build it as well right. with them effects. So if I want it to get more intense, the harder you strum it, it does become more like intense and builds into sections and stuff. So kind of use the cathedral for that mm -hmm. and then for the reverse reverb into stuff sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, well, you, you had an octave sound before where you were splitting between well, yeah. the, the two amps. You had the Kemper and something else. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we're using a Pog. Right. through my 800, uh -huh. which adds like a, a higher octave in with my, my sound, but then the Kemper's doing 
another fuzz tone, but it's like had it adds a octave below. Right. So when you got them all, it's a So it had, it's a weird riff, it's quite comedy sounding on its own, but like, uh, it sounds it. huge when everything's going, if yeah. you know what I mean, because out front, I'm, the sound guy can have as much in as he wants of the lower octave and stuff. And is that all straight cap. mono? There's no stereo panning or no. anything like that? It's just yeah, banging just straight mono. down the middle? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, so that comes in handy for that. And we got um, the Pog modded, so it takes MIDI, mm -hmm. which is quite cool, so that we can change the pog to different sure. chains and save it rather than having to tweak it all the time and stuff, which I'm surprised they don't actually do just yeah. in the pog it'd be. Because the same company do that with the cathedral as well, right. that I found, but we've never done that because we don't change it enough. This thing's pretty cool. Um, the synth nine. Yeah, because do you know whenever you think of synth guitar pedals, it's always someone doing like a wacky bass line <laughs> or like a weird piano yeah, yeah. thing. But, uh, Synthesize, uh, um, sex yeah. saxophone. Saxophone, yeah. <laughs> but we, yeah. But we've, we used it more of like an ambient, like. Yes, so it's way more like a synth. Yeah. But like, not a comedy synth, if you know what I mean? Because as soon as, like, even when I was younger, if I got a synth pedal, I'd just start playing the funniest sounding things you could on an instrument. But, like, yeah. if you use it as, like, a, a layer in a sound, it sounds quite cool. Yeah. Um, so that I do really like that pedal. The Soul Food is, like, a clean boost. Right. So I have, like, my... Yeah, so my normal clean, and then if I add the soul food over the top, you get the like. And I guess it's just like, makes it a bit more epic and, and you can like hold the notes longer, do you know what I mean? Sure. It is a massive sound. It's unreal. It's, it's just a unreal. Massive sound. Yeah. It's it's so interesting to hear because I mean you know these are pedals we know really well, but played yeah. in this context, you know, and the guitar set up and the way that you play, it's like, wow. You know, it's um Yeah. And quite the job to get that um sitting with everything. Yeah. In a live environment. I mean obviously on a record then you've got power of production, you've got mixing, you've got yeah. everything else to bring it all together. But live, that must be quite the challenge. I want to come and see you guys live. I, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I don't I haven't done so. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that's why having two different amps as well helps with, like you say, getting stuff to sit and the fact that the sound guy's got so much freedom with all the mics, mm. they can yeah. change stuff, if you know what I mean. And do you travel with the same front of house? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So they know. Yeah. Gonna they know exactly <laughs> imagine, what's going on, yeah. Imagine, yeah. yeah. Random front of house. Engineer. No, they've just been nut stuff where there's nothing coming out. It's the same, we have the same uh, in ear, well, we did up until now, I have the same in ear guy, so they know. Like, you kind of have to learn the set, if you know what I mean. Sure. Even, even like the sound guy or, yep. the, or the in ear guy need to learn what we need to hear. Sure. Because each member, as well as mix, is, is nothing like the other member. Right. Like, mine is, it sounds like guitars cranked over like a rock mix, if you know what I mean. But then some other people just have click. Like our bassist, I think, just has drums, click, and bass, and wow. nothing else, and, wow. which I couldn't do because I wouldn't feel like I were at a gig. Do yeah, you know what I mean, right. and my mix sounds like I'm still playing on stage. But how hard yeah. was that transition going to in ears? Really hard. It took me a couple of tours. Right. Like I, I kept putting them in, and then I ended up ripping them out after a song and turning monitors back on and stuff. And it's just getting used to it. It's still, it helps when you get a good monitor guy. Right. Wow. Yeah, because yeah. if you if you have a bad monitor guy, in ears are the worst things ever. Because okay. it can ruin it can it can kill you because if they don't put something through you need to hear it, you can't hear anything. Sure. Do you know what I mean? So it can ruin your show straight away. Because you don't yeah. have, you can't just go back and turn your amp up if you need Yeah, and more. you can't walk yeah. near the drummer to hear him. Yeah. Or, right. or like move away from your amp and like you say, it's 
So if you have a bad monitor guy, it's literally like torture. Because <laughs> like half of the time, they're not even listening to what they're putting through your ears. If you ask for something, they'll just change it. Right. It's like we had some nightmares where, I think we went through a tour where we had like four monitor guys because it was just hell, <laughs> like trying to get used to it. But, and then we found like, he's actually our front row house guy now, but he was our monitor guy for years and he, he was just great from the first gig and it just sounded great. And wow. it made such a difference to using in-ears. Like once they, once you get a good sound guy, you appreciate them. Oh yeah. Because now if I play without in-ears, I'm just like, this is mental. <laughs> like after about 10 seconds, the cymbals just take oh, well. all the top end off your ears. It's so like, you couldn't go back now? Um, I mean, I could, I played like, I played like a pub band jamming and stuff, do you know what I mean? Yeah. I can still I still enjoy it in that. Um, Have you got a little rock band that, that goes around the pubs around here? Do you do that? Uh, there's, because <laughs> I, I used to play um, in like working men's pubs yeah. uh, and clubs, do you know, like doing like 80s covers with like rock bands when I was younger for a bit of money while, so it was like while we were touring, when we first started, we didn't make anything. Sure. So for like a job, I kind of did that when I was home. And you, it's not bad paid, you know, when you're, when you're quite young and that. Like, just to play like a working men's and play like, rock you like a hurricane and stuff like that. But like, it was cool. And I've still got friends in that circle who were playing them bands. And uh, it was only like, I think it was last year. We were off for a while and their guitarist joined Wishbone Ash, which is random. Wow. <laughs> so yeah, he's now in Wishbone Ash. Um, so he, he like had to go on tour and they were, they were like, oh, if you're not doing anything, do you want to play these shows with? So I did like a bunch of working men's clubs like last year, but I love it. It's like just playing like ACDC and stuff. And awesome. What was that like then? So coming from the kind of stages you're used to yeah. playing, which is colossal with this massive production, in, immense amount of, you know, complication and everything. How, how does it then feel to go and sit in with guitar, bass and drums playing ACDC? I'm, I'm more nervous doing that because <laughs> yeah, it's like, right. I mean, people are there in front of you and and it's just, they're all like good musicians. Not that, I mean, our band is, but like they do it just for fun and sure, stuff. Yeah, do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. And and like, they know what they're on with. They've had, like like I say, the guitarist just joined Wishbone Ass, so he's, he's an awesome, yeah. amazing guitarist. So that to me is like nerve wracking, trying to play, I mean, trying to play like ACDC and get it right and stuff like that. So it's it's great. And I mean, one thing that goes in my favor is when I play working men pubs, Half of the people there think I'm 16, so they all think I'm. <laughs> they all like cheer me on because they think I'm like a child that they've like <laughs> let on stage for some reason. So I'll come off and people be like, "Oh, you're doing that at your age?" And I'm, like, I'm 32. <laughs> I'm not, don't uh, get that excited over it. But yeah, they all think I'm really young, so it's it, just it to get an idea. Yeah, I'm still, <laughs> no, no way. It's crazy, but yeah, but it's. It's fun. I still turned up with like an 800 and a 4x12 because I was like... That was my next question. Yeah. What did you take? Yeah. I, I used that and I used an attenuator for a little bit, but then I, to, I took it off because the more drunk people get, the louder you can turn yes. it up. So like by the second, because you play like two sets with bingo in between. <laughs> so the second set I want to be drunk, I'd be drunk and I'd just be like, well, turn it off. It's just, it's so great that, to know that nothing's changed really. Yeah. It's really wonderful. Know. I mean, the whole working men's club circuit is... It's one of the best nights out ever. <laughs> if you yeah. go and watch a band there, they're they're honestly like some of the bands are amazing as well, yeah. and like, and they're just like playing to people that are there for bingo, but they're super good bands. But it's it's I go with my dad a lot to home like because he's he's grown up going to watch bands like that. But yeah, it's cool. We should talk about guitar, shouldn't we? Yeah. We I mean we got we could literally talk for about five yeah. hours, but um, we should talk about guitars. Yeah. Yeah. So this is your. Epiphone, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, how did this come about? Um, so I met, I met someone from Gibson years ago and um, he got us playing Gibsons. So he, he came and he got, he got me a couple of Les Pauls. He got me like a Les Paul standard and traditional and stuff. And so I switched to playing them mm. and I loved them. And then he was like, oh, what, what would you think about uh, doing a custom Epiphone? And which I'd, it came from like nowhere. Um, so I was like, yeah, cool, we'll, we'll talk about it. And I'd never really played Epiphone. They were kind of like a, at that time, a bit of a bad rep around them. Sure. They'd just been like budget or whatever. Uh, but then I spoke to the guys from Epiphone and stuff and they sent me the first prototype and like, it was just awesome. Like it doesn't, it didn't feel like a cheap guitar. Sure. 
It felt good. It sounded good. We changed a couple of things and the super on side, if you know what I mean, mm. to tr- do what you want to do. Like, I, like, I don't want it weight relieved. Um, I, want, I want like a P90 in the neck. So mm-hmm. they put like a Gibson P90 in. I want this. I, I want like a fatter neck. And just like, yeah, they would have stuck for it, the colours, everything. And then, because I, I used to be obsessed with the art, artisan, the Gibson artisan. Which yeah, I, you've got one up there. Yeah, we saw it in the, the, in the rack. That's like a 76 or something. <laughs> Yeah, they ran. I had to Wikipedia yeah. this. They ran from seventy six to eighty two. Right? Yeah, if if Wikipedia is correct. So like, that had been like my dream guitar when I was first making this. So I was basically just like, can we just rip that off, looks wise? Right. Um, so they got the original guy who did these inlays to do these again. Like he sent wow. them through the original stuff. So these yeah. are like by whoever put designed them for him. They got the original ones back, uh, and all this, you know, on the headstock. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, so they they were super there you go. cool with me, um, but I also didn't want to make it look like a metal guitar. Sure, like, yeah. yeah. I, I've never been in. I mean, I, I used to be in super metal guitars, but then as I got older, I just appreciate like a nice looking guitar, and I wanted it to look like like that. Sure, you know, it's like I, that to me is like a really nice looking guitar. Mm. You've got yeah. three models, right? Yeah. So you've got the the Les Paul body shape. One. Mm-hmm. There's the Explorer, Explorer, yeah, and the RD, RD, yeah. RD. Yeah, Where so, are they? Uh, they're over there. Can I help? Yeah, I'll put yeah, it on back. You take this. What were the first Uh Explorer, I think that that came second. I think um, Joey's probably pooing his pants at this moment because I'm taking guitars out of the racks. <laughs> Yeah, so um, we did that one, that one, and it, it like got good reviews and it sold really well. So they said, "Do you want to do another one?" I'm guessing because it sold quite well. So um, I just said, "Yeah, what do you want to do?" And they were like, "Is there any other shapes you like?" And I've always liked Explorers because, like, we, I used to like Metallica. I still do. And James Atfield always played an Explorer, and he used right. to play like a Gibson Explorer back in the day. So I've always been into him, and I was just like, oh, "I wonder how it'd look." The exact same schemes, but sure. on Explorer and they sent me one and I was like, it looks great, <laughs> sounds great. Um, yeah, the so, only thing I wish I'd done is binding on the back. Oh, right. You know, because like, this one's got the double yeah. binding, but yeah. I, don't, I don't know if, in, if you can, but we forgot about it. <laughs> yeah, so but, same same pickup spec, uh, set, same wood, same everything. How, yeah. does it, how different does it sound? It does sound different. To me, it sounds more um, attacky. I don't know how to explain that, but more like uh, aggressive. Or yeah, you more uh, aggressive. Yeah, sure. This is Joey, by the way. This <laughs> <laughs> bad tune. What's the tie clip? Yeah, you got oh. one on both ends. Is it to stop resonance and stuff? Resonances. Yeah, because uh, we have a lot of like sudden stop sections. Yeah, and um, I used to just put foam in. Like in there, and it stops like any like noise. Oh, <laughs> and, wow, um, okay. But then someone made these, which I think is just a hair clip. Right. Uh, originally, uh, so you put them on, and it just it just stops any like unwanted ring, which I wouldn't put them on if I wasn't playing our stuff. If you know what I mean. Sure. So uh, if I'm playing like blues or something, it probably takes away from a lot of the like resonance of the string and all that. But just just in case you missed that, he said, in case I was playing blues or something. So just to prove that everyone really does like blues. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I don't know whether it's because there's, it seems like there's so much wood. Mm, yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, like, yeah. It, it seems really uh, attacky. It's like, I mean, you can't really tell from here because the jump's no, no, no. over there, but um, when we do it live, you cannot, you can notice a little bit of difference. It's, and, uh, and the RD seems a bit more like rounded sounding. Okay. I don't know why. I don't know whether it's because of... We'll just have a quick look, look at the yeah, yeah. RD. Uh, that's this one. I feel that like I should awesome. say... awesome. should say how cold it is in here as well. It is. So I'm playing shockingly bad. Look at that. <laughs> Yeah. It's, so it, this is the same electronically. It doesn't have any of the crazy 
Mogul no, the move stuff, like no. That, no. No, it's just a, a nice, solid guitar. And a dummy coil. <laughs> yeah, so we played a bunch of venues and because it's P90, sometimes it could be too noisy. Sure. So when we were doing the, like developing these, I said, oh, is there anything you can do to the P90 to make it hum cancelling? So they said, oh, we'll put like a dummy coil in there that should, I mean, technically it should be like a humbucker then. Mm. Yeah. And cancel out hum. So I think it helps. Mm. That's great. It's handy for like studios and stuff. Do you know if uh, if you're getting a weird ring and stuff? Yeah. A lot of the time you can just slide them on and it stops any unwanted ring. Whenever I'm playing the Gretsch, I'll play a chord and I'm hearing all these crazy yeah. other frequencies. I'm like, okay, it's all that stuff over the bridge. Yeah. Wow. Come in handy. Very cool. Yeah, and like I said, they, they didn't feel budget or anything when I played yeah. them because I didn't want to play something just for the sake of playing it. And, sure. and it, sa it sounds good. They made the pickup for me, which sounds awesome. To me, and it's part of my sound now. Yeah, so right. I'm like, I know what it sounds like into yeah. an 800. So probably if I plugged in, if you plugged an EMG into that, it's probably not going to sound sure right. I like but the way this one's CQ. got a little uh, printout on the top there that says "Drop A Sharp." Yeah, it's a C standard. As well. <laughs> nice. Did you ever do the active pickup thing? Yeah. So when we f <laughs> when we were first doing the 5150 stuff, right? Uh, I, I had a uh, EMG 81 and then 85 maybe mm -hmm. in the neck and uh, yeah did that for a while and then we toured I forgot, oh every time I die is a band like the pretty legendary in like the heavy rock world and we toured with them and I, at that time I was running a 5150 into a 4x12 uh, and an orange rocker verb into another 4x12 and you know running them at the same time with EMGs and all this stuff and a tube screamer. And then every time I die turned up, they just had an 800 on top of like four by 12, turn it on, it sounded way bigger and better. Wow. And I was just like, oh, this is basically what I'm trying to do is like make everything bigger sounding. Uh, and then from then on, I was just like, how does it sound that good just through an 800? And all they'd got is one of them had a tube screamer. And then Andy actually had a clon, but it was way before they were as popular. Right. So I don't think, I think he told me he paid like $400 for it or something, which back then was a lot of money. Sure. Uh, I think this is like 2009, but now I'm in the worth loads. But that's where I first ever saw a clon as well. And he was telling me, he used to use Les Pauls just into that. And he was just like, oh, you need passive pickups and all this stuff. And so I just started trying them, tried bare knuckle, and it made the world difference yeah. in like, added so much back into the sound. That's so interesting. Yeah. That is interesting. Yeah. In fact, he was the first person to take me to a, a pedal shop in America. I think we were in like Portland and it uh, took me around the corner to this like pedal shop and it was full of, it was the first place I ever saw Earthquaker and wow. do you know pedals like that? Yeah. And I bought an Earthquaker overdrive, a white light, and I started using that as my drive rather than a tube screamer and stuff. But that was for, cause like England I think sometimes suffers for that. There's not like a shop around the corner that yeah, yeah. sells boutique handmade pedals. and. Sure. and Cool guitars, a lot of the time it's like Line 6 and, and stuff like that, not slagging any of them brands off. But like when in America, you, they're just everywhere. Right. These insanely good shops, like even your guitar center has a lot of good stuff. Mm. And so I think in England, it was harder when you're younger to find new gear sure. than over there. But yeah, I think touring is what helped find stuff. Wow. Um, my mind's blown. It is. It's just, I mean, to hear just, there's a lot of things that we talk about all the time. Yeah. With, as far as clarity and uh, not being afraid of the top end and, um, you know. Turn the game down. All that stuff. And it's like, well, hearing it in this context, but it's, it's like the same rules apply. Mm. You know, if you want to be, um, you know, have those elements of tone and be you know, dynamic and, and I, and I don't know if that, again, feeds into that feeling of being connected, if that's yeah. all part of that process as well. But it's like, you know, and it couldn't sound more different than anything we do. Yeah, yeah, by, by some measure. Yeah, but it's still, it's those elements are, are, are still there. It's yeah. amazing. What do you use a pitch for, for Lee? Um, it's like a Digitech whammy. Do you know the yeah. super high octave? Yeah. Um, so it's just for like... 
<laughs> it's just a weird solo thing that just does weird sounds, basically. Yeah, give us some of that. <laughs> it's just that that thing. But I only use it on that one bit. But then I, because I basically had to like take it out because I kept kept pressing it in the set just for fun. <laughs> so there's like ring out bits where it sounds, but if you press it, it sounds like an alarm's going off. <laughs> so it'd be like. <laughs> like doing stuff like that. I know it's like, we'll take it out of the other songs because I have to just keep pressing it now because it's like addictive just to do that sound. I didn't know. Time. So can you set that on and off, on and off all moment trees? Yeah, yeah, you can put it latch or so it's just on and off. I didn't know it did yeah. that. Yeah, and you can select like, if you want it to be full effect and all that stuff. Because we do have a drop, you know, the Digitech drop. Uh -huh. Because we carry quite a lot of guitars anyway in different tunings, but if there's like one song in a different tuning, we'll just drop it with that. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, which, I mean, ideally we'd have another guitar because it does sound slightly duller and mm -hmm. stuff, but live again, probably no one's going to care. But it comes in handy as well because, like, say, if I broke a string and I had a guitar in a higher tuning, Joy can just like drop that guitar okay. down and swap me out and stuff. So. That is really handy, the drop pedal. As if by magic, uh, I can't walk into a building and not spot a Strat. So <laughs> I saw one in the guitar rack and uh, you use this live, right? Yeah. Um, when we were in the studio last time, I started, there was a, a couple of guitars there and stuff. And I used a Strat on a song to record. And then I was like, I'm probably gonna have to get one to use live now. And to be fair, cause I've never used one live or anything. I was quite excited just to have one, <laughs> like to use one live. But um, this, I just swapped one of my customs with my friend. He was right. like, I've got too many strats. Do you want to swap one for one of your customs? And I was like, yeah, And but I love it. Like, I mean, it's, he bought it like secondhand and it's been painted badly and stuff, but I kind of prefer that. And I bought like another strat uh, recently. And I actually prefer this one. I think this is one is cheaper and stuff, but for some reason it just plays super nice. But it's a it's just for like specific tones. It's like weird stratty tones, if you know what I mean. And then on the same song it's got like a fuzz, but I used it on single coils mm -hmm. on the CD. So mm -hmm. this is another example of like, it's got the Kemper on doing like weird. Really ambient sounding again. Uh, and then the... That kind of sound. Which is quite, Harsh. It's, but, it's aggressive, isn't it? Yeah, Again, aggressive. But it works live within, because like I, we'd set it way less than that, and then in the mix, and live everything always comes across more, like, not aggressive, but rockier, I guess, right. than like on a CD. So it works live, and it has like a big. <laughs> what the? <laughs> Not even drop D. <laughs> I'm just like, what's going on? Yeah, so fuzz, like, it's got. Which is quite a big fuzz, but it works well with these pickups. And you're keeping on the single coil for that sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. I, when we did the turn, we did it to, to keep it on that setting. So mm. I didn't have to keep switching. I, to be fair, I don't always like switching pickups. Right. I like the sounds. Mm. But like they're doing it, I'm not, very, I'm not very accurate at. So we do that, and then we use a EQ pedal quite a lot now. Don't like it's coming super handy. The for, free the tiny EQ. Yeah, yeah. Because you can preset awesome. on that as well. Yep. So, and it's analog. Yeah, and we we EQ quite a lot of like, I think for the for the verse sound like the we've got it like. Driving, but Joey searched online for like a tube screamer EQ boost sort of huh, range can, yeah. and pushed it like that because I used a tube screamer in the studio, but I didn't have one on tour. So we just did that and it added that like mid range uh, bass cut sort of thing. So we, we use it for a lot of stuff like that. And then it comes in super handy for sections. You know, if I want less, less gain, you can like drop the level on it and mm -hmm. stuff like that mm -hmm. or boost the level. So I've got like guitars where that humbucker 
is so much louder than the single coil. So when I go to them, everything's too quiet and we've right. boosted the EQ, uh, the level of the EQ to bring them pickups up just for their them sections and stuff. And, that, and, and you go to a specific section of the song, that will change automatically and you just go to the yeah. to this pickup. And, yeah. yeah, wow. And on that guitar, it will be a low out, output hum, uh, single coil and mm -hmm. it will be boosted up and then we'll EQ it so it's not like muffled or anything. Sure. But like... It's only recently we put the EQ pedal in, but it's it's helped so much with specific right. tone wise sort of stuff. But that's another thing that I, I, you learn constantly. Do you know what I mean? With like tweaking yeah. sounds and stuff, and that come in super handy. It's a whole different level, isn't it? It's, it is. You know, we come from a world which is play a set of songs and you sort of feel your way through the sounds and mm. just whatever's working. But in your case, everything's got to be bang on because yeah. it's the, the rest of the production and the performance and everything. Yeah. It's a completely different way of thinking. And a lot of time the set starts and doesn't stop, if you know what I mean. It's yeah. to one. Yeah, right. So you press play on the click and then everything kind of goes from there. And you, so you haven't really got time to mess about. It's discipline, isn't it? It's yeah. Intense. Are you knackered at the end of the show? Yeah, but I'm just unfit. <laughs> so I don't know whether that's... <laughs> That's because of that, but like, yeah, it's it's definitely different to like it's it's grown into this. If you know what I mean, yes, we we went through the whole stage where it was just a rock show. Mm. Everyone were a little bit pissed when we're playing. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and yeah. stuff like that. And I suppose eventually you think, oh, I'm kind of gonna have to take this really seriously now because it's it's as life. And do you know what I mean? Like, we've been doing this. I think it's fifteen years now. So like, wow. it's pretty crazy how far it's got. And then. You obviously get into bigger, better venues, and you think, yeah, we've got to take this mm. serious now and make it sound good and stuff like that. So, yeah, like the whole switching and stuff, I appreciate it. it looks better on stage that I'm not having to stand at a pedal board. Sure. I can be more like interactive with what's going on and stuff. So, yeah, it, it's all just like growing steps, but it's hard to get used to when you're like a bit of a gear nerd guitarist and you want your pedals in front of you and then you switch them to a rack and then you sure. switch them to not even pressing them. And stuff like that, so yeah. Uh, there was one more guitar we were going to look at, wasn't there? We've looked at the strap, oh, yeah. we've looked at the... It was a Gretsch. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Gretsch, that's what it was. But another thing about like, do you know what I'm saying? America's got pedal shops everywhere and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. But like, so many guitars in America that I've never seen in England. Mm. And then we'll go and I'll just be like, what is that? And like, we went to, me and Joey always go to Chicago Music Exchange because they always have stuff in that, I don't, you don't even see on eBay in England. Um, yeah. Like I got a weird Gibson uh, like super strat last time we went and stuff like that because you're just never going to find it in England. And then like saw this and it looks just like, I don't know what I like, like just the wood finish, double cut, kind of like Les Paul, do you know what I mean? And basic and I played it and I was like, I'm going to have to buy it because I'm never going to see it again. Right. And, it, and use it live and it sounds great. And then it's got like a coil tap, but it sounds different. Like, you know, it's just got like a, a really cool sound to it. So that's probably going to end up on like some CDs because it doesn't just sound like a, a normal split humbucker. For some reason, it's got like a different sound to it. But I just like buying weird guitars rather yeah. than. Have you, know you seen it? Is? Do you know what model it is? It's called a BST. Okay. But they call it the Gretsch Beast or something. Yeah, yeah. But um, I think they were only like fairly budget. Is it old? When it, is it? Yeah, I think it's were it like 80s or something. Mm, yeah. I don't, think, uh, I don't think it was that. I think it was like 90s or something. Oh, worry. Right. Oh, right. Yeah. I can't it's remember. It's like a budget model. It's not yeah. Expensive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not like, I mean, it's, if you look at like the neck joint and stuff, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's super like raw, but it's kind of cool. cool for that that aspect of it. But it's, it's a cool sounding guitar. Uh, but that shop, Chicago Music Exchange, is like deadly if you're a guitarist <laughs> that yeah, likes yeah. guitars. Have you been? I haven't, but we watch all their videos. Yeah. So. It's <laughs> is crazy. Is there a threat too? Look, yeah. yeah. Weird. But yeah, every time we go in there, I'm just like. So you, when you're touring, you're always hunting for yeah. new things. I mean, it's mainly that one now because we know the shops. Oh, okay. Pretty cool, like, and they always have weird stuff. You, like, you. Another thing with it as well, you look on websites and you'll see something you really like, but then when you go in and play some, the stuff, it's always so different to what you imagine. If you know what I mean, like the, this three three five I got. Um, the artist one that's meant it's meant to have all the Moog stuff in, mm -hmm. but it had been taken out of that and it had got uh, is it Seth Lover? Then pick it's, yeah. yep. it's got them pickups in and it sounds like insane and it's probably the nicest guitar I've ever played. Wow. Um, but there was one there original 
at the same time with all the Moog stuff in and that. And I played it and it was it's just totally different. Yeah. It like it sounded not that good, played really bad. And then that one just played insane. I think it's had a refret at some point. Okay. But it's just one of them things like you don't know what you're gonna come out with, but sure. you're probably gonna come out with like a, a weird guitar. I sense but, a yeah. trip coming down. Yes. And it's definitely worth going. Well mate, um this has been fascinating. Uh, thank you so much for having us. Um, wow, my mind's blown. Yeah, for the three people watching this who don't know who Bring Me The Horizon <laughs> are, uh, please check them out on whichever music streaming service you uh, uh, you use or better still go and buy some records and uh, and just have a flick through the, the, the progress of this band. It is it's fascinating. It, it, it heartens me yeah. in this day and age to hear a band make the progression that you guys have done yep you know rather than let's make the same album five times have an argument and split up you guys are like <laughs> constantly moving forward and it is inspiring so, yeah oh cool yeah thank you and still use lab marshals yeah yeah <laughs> wonderful one of the own <clears throat> all right cheers guys thanks so much hope you enjoyed that uh, massive thank you to our preferred retailers and all the stuff check the links below also massive thank you to everyone that's gone to that pedalshowstore.com and grab stuff and Beanies and t-shirts, <laughs> t-shirts. and pedals yeah. and stuff. Yeah, um, yeah. brilliant. Thank Cheers, you guys. Joey, yes, thank you, Joey. Today. He's been legend. Yeah. And of course, thank you to Lee, mate. Oh, really no appreciate it. Thank it's you. been awesome. Right. Cheers, guys. Have a great day. See you soon. Bye. Cheers.